you for joining the virtual public meeting for the Muddy River Floodplain Restoration Environmental Assessment. My name is Erica, and I will be the moderator for tonight's virtual public meeting. Now I would like to provide everyone with a quick summary of what will be covered during this virtual public meeting. Our presenter will provide an overview of the NEPA process and why an EA is required for this proposed action, followed by more detailed project information, including what the proposed action is, the purpose and need, and the potential resource areas that might be analyzed as part of the environmental assessment process. Following that presentation, there will be time to address project-related questions and open the floor for those who would like to provide a verbal comment during this public meeting. Finally, there will be a brief overview of the next steps of this project. Before we discuss the project, I want to set out some ground rules and etiquette for this public meeting. First, all attendees will have their camera and microphone off for the duration of the meeting until such time when those who requested to provide verbal comment when they registered for this meeting will be called on and their microphone will be turned on. At that time, each person will have no more than two minutes to provide their verbal comment about the proposed action. Should time allow, anyone else who would like to make a verbal comment will be allowed to speak. Please be courteous and respectful of others' opinions and statements. If anyone makes rude, threatening, or otherwise hostile comments, they will be removed from this Zoom meeting and will not be allowed to re-enter. You may type the project-related questions into the chat box during this meeting. Please note that the questions that were submitted with the registration form ahead of time will be answered first. As time allows, questions submitted in the Q&A box will be addressed. Only those questions directly related to the proposed action will be answered. The audio, visual, and chat portions of this meeting are being recorded. So if you do not wish to be part of the public record for this meeting, please do not make any comments, written or verbal, during the meeting. Lastly, should you have any issues hearing or seeing the presentation or for any other technical issues with Zoom, please type your issue into the Q&A box or call the phone number included within your confirmation email. Now I will cover how you can set up closed captioning in Zoom. Click on the captions button if you are using the mobile Zoom app or the show captions button if you are using Zoom on a laptop or computer. You can find this on the bottom of your screen. As presenters speak, words will continue to scroll across the bottom of your screen. You can turn this function off by clicking the hide captions button in the same area of your screen. Throughout today's meeting, the public can submit any questions into the Q&A box. We will keep a record of all Q&A submissions. For those of you who are not familiar with Zoom, I would like to use the Q&A box. This slide provides some instructions on where to find the icon. You will want to click on that icon to open the Q&A box. You will then be able to type your questions into the Q&A box. <clears throat> Excuse me, once you have finished typing, be sure to click enter to submit what you have typed. The Q&A box can also be used if you're having technical difficulties, or you may call the phone number provided in your meeting registration confirmation email. I appreciate your patience as we work through those necessary topics for how tonight's meeting will work. I will now turn it over to Bruce Silto, the field manager for the Las Vegas field office, who will provide the welcome and introductions. Bruce. Thank you, Erica. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the virtual public meeting for the Muddy River Floodplain Restoration Project. My name is Bruce Solito. I'm the field manager for the BLM Las Vegas Field Office. I appreciate you joining us tonight. The BLM is conducting a 30-day public scoping period for this project. The scoping period is part of the environmental review process required by the National Environmental Policy Act. 
The presentation tonight is intended to share information uh, with you all about the about this project, uh, uh, about the Muddy River project, and the BLM does manage a portion of the Muddy River floodplain. We are also here to gather your ideas, your resource concerns, and your information that could be used to enhance the environmental review and analysis. Your input now and throughout the planning process will help ensure that we address any concerns that you might have and that we incorporate your unique knowledge of the area that will contribute to the rest restoration of this valuable floodplain. So before we begin with this presentation, I'd like to introduce you to our speaker tonight, JJ Smith. JJ is the project manager for the Muddy River Project. He will also uh, be joined by several pro BLM sub subject matter experts working behind the scenes to help answer your questions later in the meeting. So at this time, I'd like to turn it over to JJ. Well, thank you. Thank you, Bruce. I uh, appreciate that. And thanks everyone for attending tonight. We really appreciate you taking time out of your busy day for this. So let's get started with a brief timeline of the uh, development of this project. We really began discussing ways to improve the flooding and uh, some of the conservation issues in this area quite a few years ago with a broad range of stakeholder engagements. In 2021, we circulated a draft funding proposal for review, and we received some feedback and support to proceed with, with this proposal from stakeholders, including Clark County Regional Flood Control, the Moapa Band of Paiutes, and the Southern Nevada Water Authority. And then in 2022, that proposal was su successful, and we were awarded Southern Nevada Public Land Management Act funds that's through their conservation initiative program. Uh, and we've begun some preliminary studies and surveys, including a flood inundation study and some endangered species surveys. Last fall, we began reaching out to stakeholders for more specific input to help move the project from the conceptual phase, where it is now, and into the design phase in the coming months. The public meeting tonight is another phase of this stakeholder outreach and engagement. By the end of this year, uh, we hope to complete the planning process and begin the work on the technical design. And then we aim to implement the project uh, from roughly 2025 through 2027, and then begin monitoring the, the project. To get everyone oriented, you can see the project area shaded in this satellite image in yellow here in the center of the slide. Upstream of that, just a little further up and to the left in the picture, you can see the dark green vegetation that's labeled Warm Springs. This is the headwaters where the year-round flow of the Muddy River originates. If you look further upstream in the upper uh, left portion of the slide, there are two desert washes uh, with their dashed lines on the map. These are muddy wash and piranigate wash. And these only have surface water during flood events. Uh, and then finally downstream of the project area, which is southeast or the, the lower right corner of the, the slide here, you can see where Meadow Valley Wash joins the Muddy River just before it passes uh, beneath Interstate 15. Okay, looking at land ownership and management, again, with the project area in the center of the slide in that brighter shade of yellow, and a lot of other BLM uh, managed public land surrounding that in that more mustard shade of yellow. Um, a lot of the warm springs now, which are upstream of the project area, are managed by the Southern Nevada Water Authority's warm spring natural area. And that's in, in green, shown in green here on the map. The Fish and Wildlife Service manages the Moapa Valley National Wildlife Refuge, and that contains a lot of the other main springs. And that's uh, this brown, dark brown color on the map. 
Clark County manages riparian reserves for conservation, both upstream and, and downstream of the project area. Uh, and these are in this bright blue color. The areas in uh, white are private property, and this includes a large residential area just to the east or to the right of the project area. And then downstream, the Muddy River flows directly from the project area into land that's managed by the Moapa Band of Paiutes. So I'd like to share a little bit about why we consider this area so valuable from a conservation perspective. A big reason is the rich diversity of aquatic species that, that live in the river. Uh, this includes eight endemic aquatic species that occur nowhere else in the world, and their names reflect uh, their importance uh, and the import importance of this location. The Moapa dace, the Moapa white river springfish, Moapa pebble snail, and the list just goes on. Other wildlife uh, depend on the stream side vegetation, which we refer to often as the riparian area or the riparian zone. And where it's healthy, this riparian environment includes an impressive diversity of wildlife especially birds. The Warm Springs Natural Area, which is just upstream of the project area, has reported over 200 species of birds. And among these are two endangered species, uh, the Southwestern Willow Flycatcher, which is shown here on the left, and the Western Yellow-Billed Cuckoo, which is shown on the right. The, both these birds likely move through our, our project area on their way to a uh, better habitat upstream. Uh, and they may forage for food in the project area. A few may attempt to create nests here, but we're not sure that's happening yet. Now let's take a closer look at some of the changes to the river environment. In the past, the river had the ability to change courses and meander through the entire river valley, which is shaded here in green. So that's from cliff to cliff. These blue lines in the picture represent some of the many paths that the river could have taken and probably did take at some point in the, in the past. During this period, the Muddy River would have been a shallow stream uh, or maybe a series of streams lined with willows, cottonwoods, and other riparian uh, plant species. Shallow groundwater beneath the floodplain would have supported very dense vegetation, uh, vegetation uh, perhaps some areas of wetlands and quite a bit of wildlife. During floods, water would have been able to spread out across the entire river valley. Uh, and that would lower the height of the flood water, disperse some of that erosive energy that water has and, uh, and uh, slow the water down as it moved through the valley. Eventually, though, it would reach the White Narrows at the bottom of this, this uh, section of valley. And you can see this labeled at the bottom of the map. It's a, it's a narrow gap in the cliffs that's just over 600 feet wide, called the White Narrows. The situation today has changed pretty dramatically. The river is now confined to a single channel on the west side of the valley. And it's been confined here for the the last several decades. The reason for this constriction uh, of the floodplain is that agricultural fields were established. The fields were cleared of native vegetation. They were leveled, they were terraced. Uh, and then a levee was constructed roughly along this dashed line on the east side of the river, right up against the river. Uh, and it was placed there to protect those agriculture fields from flooding. So now the area where water can spread out, at least during the smaller frequent floods that come through, has really been restricted to a sliver of land on the west side of the river, shown here in green. Now, a, a couple of points on this. First, the levees up to uh, about eight feet high in some areas. This is just an earthen levee. But it drops down to two feet or lower, especially as you uh, get downstream closer to the White Narrows. Also, very large floods, a medium to large floods, they're not affected by the, the levee. A big flood 
can and will spread out across mo most or all of this, this river valley, despite the existence of the levee, if it's a big enough flood. Smaller floods, though, they're currently res restricted to this, uh, this smaller floodplain on, on the west side of the river. <clears throat> uh, another point, since 2014, there have been a few flood events that have broken through the levee in at least two places. And that's indicated by these blue arrows on the map. These breaches in the levee happened about 10 years ago and were caused by woody debris getting caught on old irrigation pipes and uh, concrete footings and other objects in the stream. These debris dams temporarily diverted water out of the stream channel. Some of that debris washed in from upstream where a lot of these old agriculture fields are reverting to riparian forest. And then some of the debris came from projects within the, uh, uh, from, uh, uh, came from within this project area that we're talking about from treatments that we did to reduce tamarisk, which is also known as salt cedar. Uh, and this is an invasive species, <clears throat> excuse me, it's caused a lot of environmental problems throughout the Western United States. And despite our efforts to keep the debris out of the stream channel by chipping like you see in the uh, upper right and piling and burning like you see in this lower, in these lower photos, we know that some of this material ended up in the, in the stream channel and contributed to these debris dams. So we're very aware of the issues that this can cause to adjacent lands and also downstream. Fortunately, the major tamarisk treatments have been completed in the area, but it's worth noting that even where tamarisk is not an issue, former farmland throughout the, this whole upper portion of the Muddy River Valley is reverting to native shrublands and woodlands. So there will, <clears throat> excuse me, they'll continue to be woody debris moving through this system during flood events. Uh, and there are also a few wild cards, including the beaver population. Uh, there are beavers out there, and as their favorite food increases over time, uh, their population uh, may increase. So that could be more of a factor in the future. Okay, back to the levee. In addition to restricting the size of the floodplain, levees force water into narrow channels where the energy of that water can lead to down cutting, where the stream channel keeps getting deeper and deeper. So th this means that the channel, uh, you know, one thing it means is the channel can hold more water during a flood before it eventually spills out of its banks. But that's not necessarily a good thing, especially if you're downstream of one of these uh, channelized rivers and you don't necessarily want a big pulse of water arriving all at once. Another effect of this uh, down cutting, which is also called incision or an incised channel, is that it can contribute to a drop in the adjacent water table. And we suspect this is the case within our project area. Uh, we have some monitoring wells not too far from the edge of the stream that have a depth to the groundwater of about 20 feet. So it's pretty hard for some of the native trees like willows and cottonwoods to become established under these conditions. Uh, unfortunately, tamarisk really thrives in these conditions. It can reach water very, very deep underground. So here's a little diagram that illustrates our situation. We have a channelized river caused by the levee and a floodplain that's disconnected from the stream, meaning uh, routine floods can no longer spread out and slow down and shallow groundwater is not available for the establishment of native trees. Tamarisk, like I said, on the other hand, can reach this deeper water. So over time, it became the dominant tree species. And not just on some of these higher terraces of the floodplain where the water's naturally deeper, but throughout the entire river valley. Some native plants though, uh, especially honey mesquite, uh, can uh, have recolonized after the agriculture activity ceased, which is good, but now they occupy space where cottonwoods and willows could be if the water was more accessible to them. So here's a diagram of 
uh, a much better situation. It's a floodplain that is reconnected with the river. Upper terraces or areas with deep groundwater have fewer tamarisk trees and are mostly dominated by honey mesquite, which is the species that can reach that deeper water. The floodplain has uh, shallower groundwater that supports the recovery of species like willow and cottonwood, ash, uh, screw bean mesquite, which is a, another species that provides uh, wild, wildlife habitat for a lot of, a lot of uh, wildlife species. So based on that desired future condition, we've begun to spell out some goals for this project. First, we'd like to begin the process of reconnecting this floodplain to the river, where it's practical to do so within the project area. We also want to be good neighbors and mitigate, if we can, uh, floods in this portion of the river valley and for people living downstream. Uh, and we would do this by giving the, the smaller, more frequent floods a place to spread out across the floodplain, a little bit more room to spread out. Uh, another goal is we want to continue to manage invasive plants and re restore native species that support wildlife, including the two endangered species that I, I mentioned earlier. And then we want, we want to explore the next steps. So part of this project uh, provides funding for us to take a look at whether we should do anything beyond just giving the river some breathing space. For example, um, could we at some point in the future uh, raise areas of the stream bed or lower portions of the floodplain? Could we create man meanders in the stream channel or some other features that would uh, help address some of these flooding and conservation issues? A few additional goals for this project. Currently, we we just don't have a lot of information on the traditional uses or the recreational uses out there. So we're interested in learning more about how we can maintain access. Uh, should we try to enhance it? Uh, or are there changes that uh, we should be taking a look at and analyzing? We're also actively seeking collaboration and looking for ways uh, to provide opportunities for people to participate. And this could include anything from providing input right now on the project design or participation later on in reestablishing some of these native plants, especially if we can get some young people. Just a couple of weeks ago, we had a, a, a volunteer event uh, along the Virgin River near Mesquite, where we volunteers came out and planted 350 trees. So there are plenty of opportunities to get involved. Uh, we're also with this point of converting tamarisk thickets and reestablishing native trees, we feel like we've made some strides in reducing the wildfire hazard in this area. But we're also looking for opportunities, as we do with, with any project, to create defensible space for wild, wildland firefighters, uh, to speed up firefighting response time, those sorts of things. So that's another goal. So how do we accomplish these goals? The best management practice for reestablishing a natural floodplain uh, for a river that's confined by these artificial features like levees, and that's what you see in this upper left diagram, the best management practice is to get rid of those, and that's what you see in the lower diagram. Uh, there, there are no longer farm fields adjacent to the river that need to be protected. But there are other things. There's private land uh, adjacent to this, this property. So uh, the, the practice in these cases is to create smaller levees and set them back as far as possible from the river, like you see in this lower right diagram. And that sets the, sets the stage for natural recovery of the floodplain between the levees that are now spaced farther apart. So what does that look like at our project site? It could mean removing all or a portion of this existing levee, which again is aligned more or less along this uh, dashed line on the, the left picture. Um, and then we replace it with a smaller levee further from the river 
somewhere around where we've drawn this bright green line over in the right diagram. So we think it would make sense to locate it as close to the private property boundary, which is about 500 feet away from the stream, but a lot more work uh, is needed to pin down those types of specifics. So how much of the old levee would need to be removed, the exact placement of a new berm or, or levee, where it begins in the north and ends in the south, all this will depend on the engineering and cost constraints and the input that we get from you and from other stakeholders. And finally, just to reiterate this point, we're at the beginning of this NEPA planning process that we use. And we're located on this bubble here with the yellow star, the very first one. So during this scoping period is a great time to provide us with feedback that can really help shape some of the specifics of the project, how it's developed, what alternatives um, that we take a look at and analyze the uh, environmental impacts of, information on historical or current uses, or really anything else that you think of that could help inform uh, this project as it's developed. We'll combine what you learn from you and from our ongoing meetings with tribal communities, uh, other agencies, technical experts, and we'll assess the environmental impacts of any alternatives that we develop. And then we'll share that assessment with you and with uh, the other stakeholders so that everyone can review it and provide comments before any decision is made. And that's all I have. So thank you again for your time. And I'll turn it back to Erica to pick off the question and answer session. JJ, uh, for the question and answer period, the Q&A period, I will read through the questions that were submitted in the Q&A box during the meeting and call on JJ to respond um, as time allows. So some of the questions may be answered with a written answer via the Q&A box after the Q&A session time has elapsed. Um, after this meeting, I encourage you to find additional project-related information at the website shown on the screen. And we'll take a look now and see if we have any questions. Um, and once again, please do um, put your questions in the Q&A box. And JJ, we have a question that has just come up here. And the question I have is, uh, what is the estimated cost of the restoration project? Well, good question. We don't know the answer to that yet. Um, that will come with the next phase as we um, hire an architecture and engineering firm to help design the project. So if it's a, uh, you know, depending on the size, shape, length of a new berm, how much material has to be removed with the existing levy, uh, all those things, um, how much design work is going to have to go into it. So we're not sure. Um, we're estimating for our proposal that we um, we received, we estimated three and a half million dollars. Uh, we'll see. Thanks, JJ. And uh, once again, we're just waiting for more, some more questions to come through. So while we wait, um, for those of you that are here with us tonight, definitely you can go to the Q&A box and type any question, questions that you may have on the proposed action. And uh, we'll do our best to uh, uh, get you some responses. And I do see some typing, so we'll just uh, sit tight here. All right, we have a question here from Katherine Wilson, and the question is, uh, will the EA evaluate the potential effects favorable or not downstream from the project? Yes, that's one of our primary concerns. Um, is it's what will the effect be on uh, flooding, especially? downstream and adjacent to the property. So we actually started laying the, the groundwork a couple of years ago, and we uh, entered into an agreement with the U.S. Geological Survey 
and they've produced a, uh, a more up-to-date flood inundation study. There have been a few in, in the area over the years, uh, and they just recently published that. So it's available online, and we can get you the, uh, the web address for that, and uh, I guess just put it in the, in the uh, Q&A response for you. Somebody will get that, get that for you. So we're going to be taking a close look at that and any other studies that um, that need to happen so that we get a good handle on, um, hopefully not how we can just um, avoid impacts, but actually uh, sort of solve some of the conservation issues while simultaneously, um, you know, helping with some of these minor, uh, minor, you know, smaller flooding uh, concerns that downstream and adjacent neighbors have. Thanks, JJ. And once again, do keep those questions coming. If anything comes to mind, go ahead and type that into the, the Q&A box. We appreciate the comments so far. And we'll just stand by here to see if there's another question that comes through. Wanting to make sure we leave some time here for you all, if you've thought of anything that you would like to ask our presenter today. All right, JJ, I see another question has come through. Um, and also from Catherine Wilson, the question is, do you expect to need a section seven consultation? And I'm not sure if most folks will know what that is anyway. So if you could elaborate on that, that would be great. Yeah, sure. That's a good question. Um, and we, for projects like this, um, we're required to consult with the Fish and Wildlife Service um, and it's called Section 7 because that's, it's, that's the section in the Endangered Species Act that requires uh, consultation with them. And we anticipate this is an informal, what's called an informal consultation. Um, it still has a, a process um, that, that's outlined. And we've already had someone from Fish and Wildlife Service visit the site with us, and we've begun uh, the process of collecting data. So we have a contractor out there um, doing surveys in uh, last year for the Southwestern Willow Flycatcher, and then beginning this year, again for the flycatcher, and then also for the Western Yellowbill Cuckoo. And uh, those surveys are ongoing. So that's the next step in the process. And then we'll, we'll see what, what data comes back and reach out to the Fish and Wildlife Service again and, um, so that, that's part of the process. Um, there are several things we can, you know, we can do to work, work with the Fish and Wildlife Service to minimize any impacts to threatened and endangered species. So those, those are definitely forefront in our minds right now. Thanks, JJ. And definitely keep those questions coming once again. Um, if you have anything that you would like to ask uh, in relation to the proposed action, please do type it into that Q&A box uh, and um, we'll see if we can uh, provide a response to your question about the project.
JJ, we're just going to try to give folks a few more minutes to see if something comes to mind that they want to, to ask about the proposed action. Um, so hopefully you can hold on while we uh, just uh, uh, pause for a few moments and let people think if there's anything else that they would like to, to uh, put forward as a question. Sure thing. Thanks, Thanks, Eric. Thanks for all your responses so far. <laughs> We're going to go ahead and move on to the, the comment set, um, section or session of the meeting. Um, but I also do want to remind you all that we'll continue to answer any of the uh, answer questions about the proposed action uh, throughout the meeting uh, through the Q&A box. Uh, so if you do have any questions, to, do please um, uh, type them into the Q&A box. And JJ, once again, thank you for, for uh, all your responses. All right. <clears throat> so what I'm gonna do now is we're gonna shift and I'm going to provide some information regarding the public comment process for tonight's meeting. All right, to get started, I will discuss more specifically the types of comments BLM is seeking during the scoping period, which began on February 27th and will continue through March 27. During the scoping period, applicable federal, state, tribal, and local agencies, along with affected members of the public, are invited to provide comments specific to the proposed action and items to consider, such as potential alternatives or impacts to resources within the project area, rather than those that simply state support or opposition to the proposed action. This virtual public meeting is one piece of the public engagement process, as are the written comments submission submitted. Um, th the submission options are shown here on this slide for your written submissions. All emailed comments must be received by 11.59 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time on March 27, 2024, or postmarked by the date, if mailed, to be considered within the draft EA analysis. Uh, comments may be submitted uh, to the mailing address or email address shown here on the slide. We'll pause here for a moment so you'll have a chance to uh, read and if, if necessary, um, if you'd like to jot down both that uh, address for mailing in your comments as well as the email address that's shown here on this slide. Before I call on the first commenter, I would like to review our meeting etiquette and process for commenting. For an individual to provide a verbal comment today, we requested that they note this when they registered for the meeting. However, should time allow, we may open the floor to others wishing to make a verbal comment. For our comment approach today, each commenter will be announced. They should then click the raise hand button at the bottom of their screen and the meeting host will allow them to unmute themselves. I will ask that they state their first and last name for the record, then each commenter will be limited to two minutes. At the end of two minutes, the commenter's microphone will be muted and we will move on to the next commenter. The right side of this slide shows how the commenter will make them take themselves off of mute. All commenters, please keep your comments civil, respectful, and directed toward a substantive comment that we are seeking during this public scoping period. Um, now, I, this slide is about commenting by phone, and it looks like we do not have anyone who called in by phone this evening. Uh, so we will go ahead and move on to the next slide, please. Okay. For today's meeting, we had one individual 
who requested to make an oral comment when they registered for this meeting. I will call their name um, and then um, if time allows, anyone else wishing to make the oral, an oral comment uh, about this project should write in the Q&A box that they want to make a public comment. I will then call on those individuals in order as time allows. So I will apologize up front in advance if I mispronounce anyone's name. Uh, you will be asked to state your full name for the public record. Once again, each commenter will have up to two minutes to provide their comment before we move on to the next commenter. The clock on the right will count down by 10 second intervals until it hits zero. Our first public commenter is Catherine Wilson. I ask now that they raise their hand using the instructions previously shown. Please take yourself off mute and state your name for the public record. You will then have no more than two minutes to provide your verbal comment before being put back on mute. Catherine Wilson, you have a comment? My apologies, I didn't remember hitting the button to say I wanted to do a comment, but I did want to say thank you. Very nice presentation. And I wonder if you can put the a copy of the presentation in the chat box. So, um, yeah, I think, and I'm not sure if it can go in the, the, the chat box, but um, the information um, will be available on the, the website that was provided earlier this evening. Um, but thank you very much for your comment on the, the proposed action. All right, let's see if we have any other people wishing to make a comment on the proposed action. Once again, please do include your name uh, or your interest in making a public comment in the Q&A box, and then we will call on you. So once again, if there is any, uh, any participants in tonight's virtual public meeting who would like to make a verbal comment during this meeting, uh, we ask that you please notify us through the question and answer box that you would like to make a verbal comment. And when we see that, we will um, call on you to come off of mute uh, by using the raise hand button. So go ahead, if you are interested in making a comment, please do notify us uh, through the question and answer of the Q&A box.
And just stating for the record again, if there is anyone, uh, any participants in tonight's virtual public meeting that would like to make a verbal comment at this time on the proposed action, please go ahead and just notify us in the question and answer box. Once we see that, we will call on you and uh, we'll have you uh, use your raise hand button so that we can have you come off of mute and provide your verbal comment this evening if you wish to do so. We're going to go ahead and move forward with the meeting. Uh, just a reminder to everyone that we will be here to, uh, to provide um, answers to the, any questions that you have through the Q&A box. Um, and definitely would like to thank uh, those that were able to make comments and provide their, their public comment today. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to Bruce to share a few ways that you can provide and participate in the public comment process moving forward. So Bruce, over to you. Thank you everyone for attending the public meeting for the Muddy River Floodplain Restoration Project. Uh, as you can see on the screen here, please remember that you can submit comments through the National NEPA Register by mail and by email. So thank you very much again for attending and have a great rest of your evening. And of course, as Erica mentioned, we will be staying on uh, until eight o'clock.